People are sharing the creepiest unsolved mysteries that they can't stop thinking about. So I decided to look into the details of each one. Brandon Swanson's case always boggled my mind. The fact that he alerted his parents that he was lost and needed help. They were on the phone with him, heading toward him, only to hear his last moments. To know they were so close is so terrifying. Recently, Reddit user URandomWeeb asked the people of our Ask Reddit to share the creepiest unsolved mystery that keeps them up at night. After reading through some of these, I will definitely not be sleeping soundly for the next couple of days. Here are the most bone-chilling cases. Warning, disturbing and graphic content ahead. One, Denise Flum, an 18-year-old, leaves home to retrieve a purse after a night out and never returns. Denise Flum left her home to retrieve her purse she left behind at a party. She was never seen again, but her car was found the next day. Denise Flum was an 18-year-old senior at Connorsville High School who had dreams of studying microbiology in college. She had plans of attending Miami University in Ohio in the fall. Denise ran track during high school and had intentions of securing a track scholarship in college. Denise was incredibly bright, was the treasurer of the science club, and played volleyball, softball, and basketball. Denise was looking forward to attending the senior prom the following month. Denise had broken up with her boyfriend, Sean M. McClung, who she had been dating for three years. Her mother, Judy, says that her daughter was becoming more social since her breakup. The day Denise went missing. The night before Denise went missing, she attended a party on a rural farm with a few hundred other students. She reportedly left her purse behind. The next day on March 28, 1986, around 12.30 p.m., Denise left her home to retrieve her purse. Denise called a few friends to see if they would go with her to pick up her purse. None of her friends could. Before leaving, she had a brief conversation with her neighbor. This is the last confirmed sighting of Denise. However, a friend would tell her mother, Judy Flume, that she saw Denise at the Fashion Bug clothing store. But when the friend described her clothing, it was incorrect. When she was discovered missing, when Denise didn't return home that evening, her parents began to worry. It was unlike her. Her parents report her missing with local PD. Denise's locked car would later be found parked near a farm. The car was parked alongside Tower Road, a gravel lane east of Glenwood, near a barn. The farmer would later tell police that it hasn't left that spot since 12.30 p.m. 1. 15 p.m. the previous day The farmer originally thought the car belonged to mushroom hunters. There was no reason for Denise to be in that area. Renewed efforts and a break in the case in 2018, the Fayette County Sheriff's Department, under the leadership of Sheriff Joey Laughlin, decided to take a fresh look at the cold case. They enlisted the help of retired detective supervisor Tom Barker, who began re-examining evidence and re-interviewing witnesses. In early 2020, Investigators announced that they had new information in the case, which led them to believe that Denise had been murdered. The new leads pointed to an undisclosed location in rural Fayette County, where they believed her body may be buried. Authorities conducted multiple searches in the area using advanced technology such as ground-penetrating radar and cadaver dogs. However, they were unable to locate her remains. Where the case stands today, Denise's case remains unsolved despite a confession made to police by Sean McClung in July 2000, Iowa 20. However, McClung died in police custody from an undisclosed terminal illness before he could be tried for Denise's disappearance. To date, the family is providing a $100,000 reward. If you have any information regarding Denise's case, please contact Fayette County Police Department at 765-825-IMTIN, ext 604, or laughlinico.fayette.in.us.
2. Melanie Melanson A 14-year-old girl goes missing while attending a party in the woods. October 27, 1989, was an average day for Melanie Jo Melanson, who followed her normal daily routine and spent her day at Woburn High School, where she was a freshman, before walking to her grandmother's home with a friend in the afternoon. After she had arrived home, Melanie had informed her grandmother that she would be spending the night at a friend's house, who lived right next door. Unfortunately, this would not be the truth behind Melanie's plans for that evening, and she would attend a party on the outskirts of town in a wooded area instead. This party, which took place on the outskirts of Woburn, Massachusetts, in a densely wooded area behind an industrial park, was attended by around a dozen high school students, all older than Melanie. According to information learned throughout the investigation, the party began to die down at around 10.30 p.m., and attendees would slowly begin trickling out of the woods, eventually leaving Melanie alone with two older boys, James Jimmy Tresca and Eugene Jean Bertini, who were the last known people to see Melanie alive that night. According to their statements to police, Tresca left the party and offered everyone, including Melanie, a ride home. Although several people would accept his offer, Melanie declined and stayed at the party with Bertini. Bertini told police in his statements that he parted ways with Melanie at the top end of a walking path at the industrial park near where the party was held. Both boys maintain their claims that they do not know what happened to Melanie that night and each claims that the other boy was the last person to see her. When Melanie's grandmother woke up the following morning and was unable to find her, she began frantically calling friends, family, and even most of the attendees of the party the night before. When Melanie's family was unable to find her, they would quickly report her missing. Officials originally believed that Melanie may have left intentionally, a belief caused by a previous runaway attempt made by Melanie. This belief, however, would quickly subside as a possibility when investigators talked further with family members and learned that there were several things that Melanie was looking forward to, including her 15th birthday, which was only five days after her disappearance, the removal of her braces, and a plan to go shopping with her father the following day to purchase a birthday present. Currently, authorities believe that Melanie was a victim of full play and that her remains are still in Woburn, Massachusetts, in the 32 years that have passed since Melanie's disappearance, police have continued their persistent investigation into her whereabouts, currently believing that Melanie had been killed that night and that her body is either in the area of where the party was held or has been moved to a different location. In 1992, Police searched a pond after receiving an anonymous tip claiming that Melanie was inside of a car in the pond. This search would turn up empty-handed. The next big movement in the case wouldn't happen until 2009 when there was a massive push for new information and the case was officially reopened. Investigators reopened the case when they received a tip involving a location near the General Foods plant near where the party was held in October 1989. Although nothing was found during the excavation of this area, the tips continue for several years, and the excavations and searches continue from 2011 to 2015. Although no substantial evidence is known to have been found during any of these searches, we do know that elements of human decomposition were found in one area that was searched extensively. The most recent update in the disappearance of Melanie Melanson was a search completed in August 2015 of a backyard which was recently made available to investigators. 3. Jeffrey Lynn Smith A 16-year-old disappears a few blocks from home. Could Lynn's high school boyfriend know more about Lynn's disappearance? Jeffrey Lynn Smith was a daughter, sister, and a friend Born on October 12, 1969, she often went by her middle name, Lynn, amongst friends and family. Lynn's mother worked for the Clinton family as a maid, and Lynn was named after Bill Clinton's stepfather, Jeffrey Dwyer. Lynn just turned 16.
Two months before she vanished, Lynn was blowing out candles on a birthday cake with family. That day, her mother had given Lynn an opal ring for her birthday. Lisa Allen, Lynn's sister and case advocate, said Lynn guarded the new ring as if it were one of the crown jewels of England, rarely ever taking it off for any reason. The day Lynn went missing. Lynn was last seen on December 4th, 1985. Her day was pretty typical. She went to school and walked home with Frank. Some reports claim that Frank Hanna was abusive towards Lynn at the time and that she was trying to end the relationship. Lynn was last seen near the intersection of Crescent Street and Silver Street in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Lynn was last seen wearing pink pants, a brown jacket, and tan shoes. She is described as being 5'3 and weighing approximately 110 pounds. Lynn is described as a black female with a mole on the right side of her chin and pierced ears. It was the first time that Lynn had ever missed a curfew, let alone not come home at all, Lisa writes in a blog post for Enkmec. A short time after Lynn vanished, with minimal leads, the family learned that Lynn's beloved opal ring had been pawned at a local shop. It is believed that her boyfriend had pawned the ring, but this has not been proven. Lynn never went anywhere without it, therefore the family knew something wasn't right when it was discovered. When Lynn is reported missing, original investigators from Hot Springs Police first classified her case as a runaway. The family disagrees. They say running away would be out of character, also considering she had no prior history of any similar behavior. Decades go by, but the family's passion for justice and answers only grows. In 2005, Lynn's sister, Lisa Allen, moved back to Arkansas and began to look deeper into her sister's case. She uncovered that Lynn's old-time boyfriend had since assaulted at least two other women. One was shot in the face, resulting in Frank serving jail time. Lisa had tracked down the two women and interviewed them via phone. After gathering her information and transcribing the interviews detailing abuse, Lisa handed over her information to Hot Springs authorities. Two years later, in 2007, the family was able to review Lynn's case file and noticed some investigative holes and inconsistencies, one of them being that Frank Hanna was never properly interviewed back in 1985. Strangely, in January of 2008, the National Crime Information Center, NCIC, had purged Lynn's case as a missing person from their system. Once this was discovered, Lynn's case was re-added. Later that same year, Lynn's case was reopened, and in the summer, authorities conducted a massive search, but no new information was found. In December 2010, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children conducted a full-day cadaver dog search near and around the 300 block of Cypress Vale Street, but it remains unknown if any new information was recovered. By 2012, Lynn's case is reclassified as an endangered missing child, and the local police announce that they have a new person of interest, where the case stands today. To date, there have been no arrests in Lynn's case. Her family is still seeking justice. In 2017, a safety seminar was held in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where authorities taught parents how to use the Safety Central app, which stores information about your child in the event that they go missing. The app and advocacy was spearheaded by Lisa Allen, Lynn's sister, 